One day God wants to do something special uh, in your life. Why do we see so many Christians struggle in their walk with God? We strive with God. We strive with each other, never seeming to find a place of rest and contentment. I mean, think about this for just a minute. We struggle in trying to find out what God's will is for us. And sometimes we even uh, wonder or question why our prayers aren't answered. And one of the things that puzzles me as a believer is why do we not see more people filled with the joy and contentment of the Lord? I mean, look around at the average Christian today and we are as stressed out and we are as stretched as anybody in the world is. And you would think that because of our relationship with Jesus, there would be something different about our lives. It is not the kind of life that God wants us to live. He did not want us to walk around just bummed out, stretched and stressed, never experiencing the joy of the Lord. Yet the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I want for my own personal life to come to a place of rest and contentment. As we study through the book of Hebrews, we've already been reminded that there remains a rest for the people of God. I mean, we find rest in what Christ has done for us on the cross, but there remains a rest for the people of God. And I'd like to suggest to you that many believers never enter into that rest. Not only have we been reminded that there remains a place of rest for the people of God, a place where we gladly receive God's grace and no longer strive with trying to live the Christian life. And the hardest thing for you and me to do is to strive to be a Christian. Amen? I'll make sure everybody's awake this morning. I know you got an extra hour of sleep last night. And I get to share with you, I had the privilege of having three extra hours of sleep this year. We did. We were in last week in Israel. Palestinian time changed on Friday. Israeli time changed on Saturday. And now we come back to the States and our time, our time changes tonight. So unlike some of you, I had three extra hours of sleep this year in the time change. So I just want to make sure that you're awake this morning. I'm still getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning, but that's, you know, that's okay. But we are reminded that there is a place of rest, a place where we can gladly receive God's grace and we quit striving about trying to live the Christian life. If you don't believe that's hard, how many of you have at one point says, I'm not going to lose my temper again. I'm going to be patient no matter what comes my way. I'm not going to let it get to me. How long does it take to get to you? I'm just being honest now. We strive. How many of us have got up and made commitments and promises to God? I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to witness. I'm going to do all the things a nice Christian should do. Amen? We do those kind of things, don't we? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to be a giver. I'm going to be faithful in my serving. Only to find out that only carries us so far. Until we run up against the wall and we meet some resistance and things aren't the same. And I've got to believe God has something more for me than just living a life of struggling. That I don't have to strive to be a, a believer. And I don't have to strive to do what I think is pleasing to God. See, I am still old school. You know, and I've shared this so many times with you guys. The generation I grew up in had a different type of parenting than we have in our generation today. I mean, parenting was just different in the 50s and 60s than it is now. And, and we were raised in a, in a different kind of environment in those days. Uh, and it was very patriarchal. It was very, you know, uh, centered around you know, dad being kind of in control of the house. And if dad was happy, you know, you hear, you hear the saying now, you know, a happy wife makes a happy life. And, and some of that's true. But, you know, in those days... You know, when dad was happy, everybody was happy. When dad wasn't happy, <laughs> you know, there were some prices to pay. You know, and, and, and y'all may not believe this about me, but I was a rather mischievous child when I was growing up. Trouble was my middle name. I, I, you know, I just, I, I did things that, that always rubbed people the wrong way. Not out of any kind of 
malice. I was just curious. I was just, um, you know, they didn't have terms back in the time when I was in school, ADD and ADHD and all that stuff. Those things were unknown of when I was in school. I was just, you know, a, a, a misbehaving child. And I learned very early, very early, that if I wanted some favor or some uh, something I wanted my father to do, give me money or give me a car or give me something, that I better be on my best behavior. Because if I was not on my best behavior, then it would do me no good to go to dad and say, may I? He'd look at me and say, nope. And then when I got saved, guess what I tried to do? I tried to carry that over into my relationship with the Lord. And I began to think, well, you know, if I do the things I know that are right, then I can go to God in, in confidence in prayer, knowing that God's going to hear my prayer. But if I mess up and I don't do the things I ought to do, then God's not going to hear me because I'm just a rebellious child. Now, you guys may not be rebellious in your relationship with the Lord, but there's so many things in my life, you know, that I was trying to base my relationship with the Father on how I lived and what I did and did not do. In fact, I was one of those Christians that was known for what you didn't do <laughs> as opposed to who you know. And, and that's kind of the way I lived my life. And then I get saved and I wonder why. You know, am I always struggling with my walk with the Lord? And, and I read these passages like Hebrews chapter nine, uh, uh, 4, verse 9, where it says there remains yet a rest for the people of God, a, a place of no striving, a place of joy and peace. It is a place marked with the fact that we know the Father has everything in his hands. And if I were to take a survey this morning, I know I'd get a 100% response on this. How many of us believe that God is sovereign? That God is absolutely in control of our life and the affairs of the world and universe? We would all say, yes, I believe that. But do we live like that? Do we live in the, in the reality that God is always in control? that he has my future, my life, everything about me, my family, my ministry, my, my everything, God has predetermined by his own will and counsel. And if I could just live in the fact that God is in control, you know how much peace that would bring to us? But in reality, we don't. So what we're going to do this morning as we look at this passage, not only have we been reminded that there remains a rest for the people of God, we have also been warned in chapter 4 that many people uh, have failed or never entered at all into the rest, of, rest that God has for them. And he gives us an example of the nation of Israel. How the nation of Israel, for 40 years, God had promised them rest. And you can read about this in the first part of chapter 4. Yeah, you know, that God had promised the nation of Israel rest, but most of that, all of that generation, in fact, except two men, Joshua and Caleb, did not enter into the rest that God had for them. And the Bible gives us the reason they didn't enter, and it's unbelief. They did not em uh, believe or embrace the promises of God. And I want to talk a little bit about that later because you can tell how you believe or embrace the promises of God. Many of us will give an intellectual assent and say, yes, I believe the promises of God. I claim the promises of God. But you look at our lives and we don't. Some things are better caught than taught. You know, and Jesus would look at the Pharisees and, and he, uh, of his day and he would look at the common people around him. He says, now listen to what these guys say but don't follow the way that they live. And so the nation of Israel refused to enter into God's rest simply because of unbelief. Why is it that two people can hear exactly the same message and walk away with two entirely different responses or reactions to that message? Because some receive it by faith, others it's not mixed with faith, and we become like the children of Israel. So as we get into verse 11, what we're going to see in verse 11 is both an invitation and a warning. 
So he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest. We're not going to talk about it this morning, but you might want to underline and look up at some point later on the word diligent. Let me just tell you this. It involves some effort on your part. It is not a passive word. It is an active word. And it means that you need to take some responsibility, some action that you're going to enter into the rest that God has for you. And we're going to explain to you uh, in the rest of this message this morning just how to do that. You know, but he says, so here's the invitation. Be diligent to enter into that rest. And then the warning, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Let me tell you this. Disobedience always brings disaster. And you can bank on that. Disobedience always brings disaster. If you don't believe it, ask Israel. Over 600,000 men died in the desert because they didn't believe the promise of God. And many Christians today struggle. Are they going to make it to heaven? Yeah, they're going to go to heaven. But the way that they get there is filled with strife and struggle and stress, and they've never entered a place of rest. So the, the, the invitation is be diligent to enter the rest. The warning is be careful about disobedience because it will keep you from that rest. So where do we find out which way we are going? How do I know if I am believing the promises of God or I am just you know, mouthing something that may not be true? Well, the answer is given in the next verse. So here we have the invitation, we have the warning. Now we could walk away this morning and, and all of us are going to hear that invitation. All of us are going to hear that warning. Some of us are going to pay attention to it. Some of us are just going to say, I'm glad this is over. I'm looking at the clock now and it's already 12 o'clock. This man ought to be finishing. By the way, we didn't change the clock in the back. <laughs> so, so don't get excited when you look behind you and see that it's 12 o'clock. I still got two more hours to go. But we're all in this room this morning. We're hearing an invitation and we're hearing a warning. We're going to respond to that in different ways. Some of us are going to say, I can't wait to get to lunch. This was boring. That old man up there doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just kind of rambling on, you know, and all this stuff about rest and stuff. It just does, you know, I rest when I lay my head on the pillow. Let me tell you, you can lay your head on the pillow all you want. And you can even go to the drugstore and buy sleep in the form of a pill. But I tell you what, you can't buy rest. You might sleep, but you may not have rest. So some of us are going to walk away this morning saying, ah, yeah, this, I don't understand all this. I guess it's just all gobbledygook. You know, it's, it's like us when we were in Israel hearing everybody talk around us. You had no idea what they were talking about. They're probably talking about us crazy Americans. You know, and we just didn't know what they were saying. Uh, but some of us are going to walk away and say, hmm. I just don't know. This, you know there, there's things that are more fun you know, than what he's talking about. Some of us this morning are going to say, you know, my life really does need a correction this morning. I really do need to be diligent about entering into the rest that God has for me. And we're going to take some action as a result of that. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that in just a few minutes as we invite you to go to the prayer tent uh, out front. But you say, your question might be, how do I know which way I'm going? What really is the attitude of my heart this morning when it comes to the things of God? Well, verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. So where do we go to find out which way we're going? We go to the Word of God. And as we go to the Word of God, it exposes our condition. And it reveals to us which way we're going. I can guarantee you 99% of the people who struggle with their walk with the Lord are striving and have never entered into a place of rest are people who avoid the Word of God. 
They don't read it on a regular basis. They don't study it. They may hear it once or twice a week uh, and then feel like they've been encouraged. But I, let me tell you, if, if you do not have a regular, consistent diet of exposing yourself to the Word of God, then you're, not, you're, you're going to be out there in some la-la land, not knowing where you're going, how you're going to get there, or what's going to happen in your life. But see, the Word of God is like a surgeon's dissecting tool. It comes in and separates what's really in our heart and what we're thinking about. And, and if I can't encourage you on anything else, let me encourage you today to be a faithful reader of God's Word. You may not understand everything you read, and that's okay. God doesn't want you to be a spiritual PhD just because you read the Bible. But let me tell you, there's something about being exposed to the Word of God that begins to dissect us. It begins to separate what our true thoughts are and the intents of our heart. As I read, I am exposed for what I am and how I need God's work in my life. None of us will ever be people of faith apart from the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, most of us know a little bit about a lot of things. And now we're in the height of football season, and we can all talk about stats and games and records and playoffs and all that kind of thing. Are we as equally adept at talking about the things of God that are revealed to us in the Scriptures? I know I'm getting on my soapbox, and y'all probably say, get down off that thing. But, you know, the Bible can be read in 72 hours. That's how long it took Alexander Scorby to read the Bible. How many of y'all listened to Alexander Scorby read the Bible? He talks slower than I do. And he can read the entire Bible. He read the entire Bible in 72 hours. People say, I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time. That's a big book. You have thousands of pages. I don't have time. Well, then you've made your decision. You're going to be out there in some kind of restlessness and disobedience, never entering into a place that God has for you. When I said in verse 11 that there is an invitation, the invitation was to be diligent to enter into that rest. Part of that diligence is me exposing myself to the word of God on a regular basis, on a consistent basis, where I am reading, I am listening to, I am studying, I am exposing myself. Because Paul tells us plainly that in the scriptures we, we see Christ. And as we see Christ from glory to glory, we're changed into his image. Now, if you don't believe all this is true, you can jot this down and go back and read it later. But in Romans chapter 7, Everybody knows Romans chapter 7. That's the chapter that Paul struggled with his own flesh and his own humanity. He says, the thing that I want to do, I don't do. The thing that I really uh, don't want to do, I end up doing. Wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free? But before he says all that, before he goes into this little discussion about his own humanity and his own flesh, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says, I never would have known that coveting was wrong had I not seen that in the law of God. And that becomes, I think, a, a mantra for you and me that we don't even know our own hearts and lives until we get into the Word and it begins to expose us. And we begin to see ourselves and God begins to perform His surgery in our lives and begins to cut away the things of the flesh, and begins to build faith in us, and begins to conform us into the image of Christ simply because we are exposing ourselves to his word. Now, I, I want to tell you, there's nothing you know, magical about this book, you know, but there is something spiritual about this book that God begins to do something in my life and your life where we, you know, we may not even know what's going on, and I could give you example after example. Isaiah says, as the rain comes down from the heavens and waters the earth so that it gives its increase, so the word of God will not return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. I don't know what that purpose is, but you know, God has a purpose. Some of the books of the Bible tell us what their purpose is. 
And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on Sunday night. The little epistle of 1 John. Only five chapters long. But John gives us three reasons in that book why he writes that book. Chapter 1, he says, in verse 4, These things I write unto you that your joy might be full. So I read 1 John. And I say, okay, Lord, I'm, just, I'm going to read 1 John, and, and your word says that the purpose for its writing was that I might know fullness of joy. And guess what? I might begin to experience joy, not even pursuing joy, because that is the fruit of God's word. You understand what I'm saying here? God's word does something to us if we just expose ourselves to it. And many of us struggle because we won't do that. The other two reasons that John gives for writing his book, chapter 2, verse 1, these things I write unto you that you sin not. You know, and, and there's something about just reading that little epistle. You know, maybe I'm struggling with a besetting sin. Maybe there's something I just can't quite kick the habit of. Maybe there's something I'm just, you know, it, it's becoming consuming in my life. I just begin to read the Bible and all of a sudden, Without me even trying to do anything, I, I realize that I am not struggling with that anymore. I've heard many, many testimonies of men who got saved. And as soon as they got saved, they're out working on a construction job. And they hit the wrong nail with their hammer. And when they do, a bunch of words come out of their mouth that aren't fit for anybody to hear. I get amused sometimes. People use profanity around me and turn around and apologize to me like I'm offended when they use uh, profanity. And I just kind of look at them and smile and say, I'm not the one you need to apologize to. <laughs> I grew up in Charleston at a Navy base. You know, so there's nothing that embarrasses me you know, about language. But you know, here are these testimonies of these guys who get saved and Jesus has done a genuine work in their lives. But they're out there, they're just beating around there. You know, they hit their thumb and they shake their thumb with blood coming out, you know, and all kind of language comes out of their mouth. But these guys continue to walk with the Lord. Six, seven months down the road, they're out there working on a construction job, and they hit their same thumb with a hammer, and nothing comes out of their mouth. That's what I'm talking about, folks. We expose ourselves to the Word of God. Something begins to happen on the inside of me. As Hebrews 4.12 says, it is quick, it is alive, it is powerful. It does something on the inside of us. One of the reasons we never enter the rest of God is because we're not exposing ourselves to his word. You know, we're, we're trying to live the Christian life. We try to go to church. We try to sing a couple of Christian songs. We try to give a little bit of our money. And we wonder why life is so hard. And this Christian deal is, is, is consuming us. Well, let me just tell you, if you begin some kind of regular, consistent way of spending time in God's Word, supernaturally, the Holy Spirit will begin to conform you into the image of Jesus. So John says in chapter 2, verse 1, These things I write unto you that you sin not. The third reason he gives is in 1 John 5, 13. These things I write unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. You know, some of us struggle, you know, I know people, and maybe you're one of them, who, you know, you got saved one time, and then after that you got saved 50 other times because you, you couldn't remember if you got saved the first time. You know, you, you responded to an altar call. But, you know, the Bible was written, John was written, so that we might be assured of our salvation. And, and there's many, many other passages like that, folks, that we could look at, but God's word's not going to return void. I begin to read it. I begin to study it. I begin to learn it. And I begin to see changes in my life. But, you know, we're back up in verse 11 now where he says, be diligent to enter into that rest. You know, it does take some effort on our part to have some regular exposure to the word of God. Amen? I mean, you've got to make some conscious effort that you're going to get up early enough in the morning or you're going to spend some time during the day uh, that you're going to open God's word, you're going to read it, and you're going to let God change you into the image of Jesus. That's a conscious decision that you make. I wish that God, would, while I was laying on my pillow at night in bed, 
would just open my brain up and pour all the spiritual knowledge in that I needed. But folks, it just doesn't work that way. It's certainly not going to help my faith. And if I'm struggling with my faith today and believing God and embracing God, the problem is I just don't know him. How do you trust somebody you don't know? And where do we learn to know God? In his word. And I'm glad he says what he does in verse 13 because, you know, we, we say, oh, yeah, that's right. I really do believe that I should be a person of the word. I, I don't do it as much as I should, but I really should be a person, person of the word. And, and don't misunderstand me. I don't want you to do this as some religious discipline. You know, the, okay, I, I'm a Christian now. I got to read the Bible. You know, if you're going to go in with that attitude, don't read it because your heart is not right. But if you go into the Bible saying, Lord, I, I need a word from you. I, I need to know what you're saying to me. You know, because there's stories of people who have read the Bible. I didn't get anything out of that. A bunch of Hebrew mythology and a bunch of stuff. I, it didn't, didn't affect me at all. You know, we're, we're back to now the person who hears and just kind of wanders away. But aren't you glad verse 13 is there? Because not only is the word of God his spiritual dissecting tool in my life, that will expose me as I really am and give me the clarity that I need to enter into his rest. I can't pull the wool over God's eyes. I might can fake the people out around me and I might can fool some of the people, all the people some of the time or some of the people all the time, however that phrase goes. And we could, people look around at us and they think we're some spiritual person and we got our act together. Well, they go to church, you know, they're a good, they're a good person. Yet God knows what's in our hearts. God knows what's going on on the inside of us. And his word begins to expose it. And if, if we were to end the, the passage there, we would just be kind of miserable walking away, wouldn't we? Because, oh, oh man, here I am exposed. You know, and here I am, God showing me all these things in my life. But, oh, and, and the thing is, folks, the more we walk in the light... Guess what happens? This is not rocket science, but guess what happens as we walk in the light? It exposes the darkness. And God exposes it so that I might learn to deal with it. All right, let's see if we can make some application out of this now. And I'm probably not going to get through chapter 5 today. I'm not going to keep you two hours, just an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> but here we are. The Word of God exposes you and me. It dissects us. It shows us our real need. It shows us the reality of who we are. It shows us the reality of who God is. His Word convicts us. It encourages us. It reproves us. Ask Timothy when Paul told him, the Word of God he declares, is God breathed and it's profitable. And he lists those nine things that it's profitable for. And you can go back and read that in Paul's letter to Timothy. But God's word is powerful. It does something to us. And then in verse 13, I can't, I can't fake God out. You know, as God begins to expose the things that are in my heart, do his spiritual work, you know, there's nothing hidden from his sight. And everything is naked and open to the eyes of him. Uh, and then it does say, of whom we must give an account. You know, so there's, there's going to come a day of reckoning. You know, I, I wish I could say that there wouldn't be, but there's coming a day of reckoning. Uh, now, for those who don't know Jesus, the day of reckoning is going to be uh, cast into a lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Eternal damnation. The day of reckoning for the believer is going to be for uh, reward or lack of reward. But, you know, the, the fact is we're going to give an account uh, and everything is going to be exposed. All right, so here's the application of this. Seeing then, verse 14, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, 
let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. We have a faithful high priest. And all of chapter 5, by the way, is going to talk about this faithful high priest that we have. We have a faithful high priest who is now in heaven. Yet before he went to heaven, he was tempted in all things like us, yet without sin. He struggled with the things of the flesh and humanity like we do, yet without sin. You know, he got tired, he got sleepy, he got hungry. He had things in his life that were trying to woo him away from following God. And we look at the temptation in the wilderness and say, well, that was divine. He was, he was God in the, in, in the flesh. He could not have yielded to that temptation. If Jesus had, could not have yielded to that temptation, he would have been more than a man. He laid aside his divinity and took on the form of man and dwelt among us. And yet the Bible says now he's in heaven, but uh, he at one time was just like us, tempted like us, he knows about our struggles. He knows what we're going through, yet he did it without sin. So because we have a high priest, there's two things that should happen. First, he said, let us hold fast our confession. What confession is he talking about? You know, we sing a song that has one of the creeds in it by Hillsong, you know, which I love to sing, by the way, because we need to affirm uh, our confession. If we believe in our heart, and confess with our mouth that what? Jesus Christ is Lord. We'll, we shall be saved. And I think we need to hold fast our confession that my salvation is in Christ alone. So I like that song so much, in Christ alone. You know, that, that of all the hope we have, of all the things we have, my hope is in Christ. God took him who knew no sin made him sin on my behalf, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Christ alone I stand, the song says. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, we see Jesus only. And my father says, this is my beloved son, hear him. We need to hold fast our confession. We need to hold high the banner that we are followers of Jesus Christ, that he is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. That's our confession. And we need to make that confession boldly. But then the next thing we need to do, it says not only do we need to hold fast our confession, but we need to boldly come to the throne. Need to, and just highlight a couple of words there. We need to come, first of all. And you guys know me, that's my favorite word in the entire Bible. The word come. God's invitation to man from the beginning is come. Come. God's invitation to man at the very end of the Bible is come. Bill is teaching us through the book of Isaiah on Sunday night. And you ought to come on out and be blessed by Isaiah. I tell you what, this is a great study on Sunday night. But that great verse in Isaiah where the Lord says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins shall be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Revelation chapter 22, the spirit and the bride say, come. come. You know, the invitation is given. And, and here, the writer of Hebrews, after talking about our state, talking about how we can't discern whether or not we're, we're following the Lord, we're, we're living in obedience or disobedience, we're, we're resting or not resting, we still have the invitation. Here in verse 16. And what's the invitation? Come. I was reminded as we are worshiping today. We enter his gates. Thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. But nevertheless the invitation is given. Come. That's the first word I want you to notice. God is not saying just leave me alone. I'm, I'm too busy for you guys right now. Don't bother me right now. You know, the, 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 the Lord is saying to you and me, come. The temple at the time of Jesus had a place called the most holy place. It had a huge curtain there. 
tradition says that was 18 inches thick that separated the place called the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And what that curtain said, what the tabernacle in the Old Testament said, uh, as they looked at that place called the Holy of Holies, it says God is not approachable. God is not approachable except by sacrifice. But when Christ was on the cross and he said, it is finished. What happened to that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place? It was ripped in two, not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom, which was saying because of what Christ has done, the door is now open to the Father. Any time, any place, by any one. And so this invitation is given here in verse 16. Let us, therefore, come. That invitation is to you and to me. Come to the throne of God. Come to Him. That's why I wanted to do that little part in the worship today where maybe something in our hearts, you know, that is, or our minds or our lives is keeping us from fellowshipping with God. And, you know, we're kind of going through the motions in our life and we're not really enjoying intimacy with the Father. His invitation is come. The Father's arms are open wide. The door is open. Why do we not do what this verse says to do? But then the second word I want you to note in this verse is the word boldly. He doesn't say timidly, shyly. He doesn't even say with reverence or respect. He says come boldly. Because the door is open. The work of Jesus is a finished work. There's nothing else that needs to be done. And we come to the Father through the Son. And I want you to understand this this morning. How righteous are you when you ask Jesus to come into your life? How righteous are you? You're perfectly righteous because you have taken on the righteousness of Christ. Can you improve on that? Why do we think we can? God took him who knew no sin, made him sin on my behalf, that I might be made the righteousness of, of God in Christ Jesus. Paul would tell the Corinthians. So I can come boldly, not because I've been doing the right thing or living the right way. I come boldly because of what Christ has done. And the veil has been torn. And then he says, come boldly to the throne of grace. I mean, this is, this, this is the, guys, I hope you're catching what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. You know, that there's many of us that struggle and wrestle and we never enter a place of rest and we strive about this Christian life. And yet the word of God wants to expose what's going on and, and open the door to let us be changed into the image of Christ. And yet we still with timidity and fear, won't approach God. And notice, let us come boldly to the throne, of, not of justice, not even of mercy, but the throne of grace. You see, folks, justice is getting what we absolutely deserve to get. And I am glad, for one, that this verse does not say to us, Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of justice. I tell you what, I would not be too bold to come to a throne of justice. I would come with timidity and fear. But he says, not even to the throne of mercy. If justice is getting what I deserve to get, mercy is not getting what I deserve to get. I don't even come boldly to the throne of mercy. I come boldly to the throne of grace which means getting what I absolutely don't deserve to get. You see the distinction here? You know, so I can come boldly to the throne of grace. Grace, it's all about grace. Someone has said grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. 
but it's the means whereby I can approach the Father with confidence, with boldness. It is grace, folks. It's not because of how I've lived or what I've done or what I haven't done. It is because He is a God of grace. And I can approach boldly. Now, I wish we had time to get into chapter 5 today, and we should have to put that off to another, another um, lesson. But in chapter 5, he reminds us of how Jesus prayed with agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. We were just in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and, and you're, there, there's, a, there's a presence there in that garden. Uh, as you look at those huge olive trees that may or may not have been there when Jesus was there, but the garden was there. Uh, and the writer of Hebrews is going to mention in chapter 5 how Jesus agonized in prayer uh, in the garden. And he agonized in prayer not for the suffering to be removed from him, but that his will might be conformed to the will of the Father. And, uh, and, and I wish you and I would get to that place of boldness in our own prayer life where we spend as much energy and effort and agony and sweat in our prayers about the will of God being done in our life as we are about him getting us out of our trouble we're in. I can come boldly to him now to receive grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What one word is missing from there when I approach his throne? Justice. I can come boldly to the throne of grace that I might obtain mercy and find grace. That's what the Father wants to do in your life. That's how we're going to enter a place of rest we find mercy and grace in the throne of God. Well, chapter 5 is a full description of this priestly role that Jesus plays uh, and the high priest that he is before the Father. And I can't wait till we get into that because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is our high priest before the Father. And it, it's so exciting. I mean... When I read passages like this, the burden just kind of falls off. I'm sort of like the guy in Pilgrim's Progress. I hope all of y'all have read Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't, you ought to. He walks around in the city of destruction with a huge burden on his back. And he goes everywhere trying to be relieved of this burden that he carries on his back till he comes to a hill called Calvary. And as he walks up the hill called Calvary and he sees the cross of Jesus there, the burden falls from his back. And he stands upright and begins his march toward the celestial city. And God, see, wants to take the burden off your back today. He wants you to receive grace and mercy at his throne. The invitation's given. Now the question is, will you respond? Why don't we stand and ask the Lord to open our hearts?